So we will continue where we left off before. And uh, we're just starting to uh, talk a little bit about frozen shoulder. You've already seen a number of these cases so far this year, but let's kind of go over it in a little bit more detail. So what we really look for in really the acute stages anyway is uh, acute edema around the region of the anterior and inferior capsule. Uh, we look uh, at the fat within the rotator cuff interval, and we look for capsular and medial collateral and medial uh, 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 thickening of the uh, uh, why do I enter uh, the middle glenohumeral of your memory. The middle glenohumeral ligaments. What I was trying to think of. Here we go. So now uh, clinically, there there have been described four stages, but this is very variable. Classically, stage one. Uh, is in the first three months. It's predominantly uh, signature really is pain and limited range of motion. Stage two is between about three and nine months. Uh, this is where you really get inferior glenohumeral ligament thickening. Pain gets a little bit better, but you have limited range of motion. Stage three is about nine to 15 months where you slowly get decreasing pain, but you still have some residual poor range of motion. And then stage four, 15 to 24 months, where things really start uh, going back to normal again. And stage yeah, one of the John. synovitis. John? Um, the new Campbell's has three stages. Phase one, uh, pain, and uh, it lasts for months. How many months, it doesn't say. Phase two, stiffness, for four to 12 months. Phase three thawing. Yeah. And uh, that's it. Okay. So, uh, so I just wanted to give you the, the, the newest orthopedic product. Great. Uh, this typically occurs in kind of middle aged females, uh, is the classic group that get this. <clears throat> and uh, it's considered idiopathic. Uh, two different types. Okay. Um, primary and secondary. Okay. Primary primary is uh, due to unknown reasons. Secondary is due to trauma, diabetes, etc. Uh, many different reasons. Yeah. Um, and diabetes. And the two close associates. Yep. Yeah, and then and and then the, all the patients I've ever treated had some kind of a psychological, a bit of an overlay. Uh, not not the athletes I've seen. Um, they just were frustrated from the stiffness and pain, etc. Okay. And okay. it's almost always um, on the the, the non dominant arm. Okay, great. Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so on the first image, um, we see kind of some increased signal in the region kind of surrounding that medial aspect of the humeral head and the region of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. It's kind of thickened and increased signal, so capsular edema. So this is kind of capsular edema you can get in the really acute phase. Uh, uh, obviously, you have to think about infection and make sure it's not of infection. But generally, with infection, you're going to get a lot more fluid. With frozen, with with uh, uh, what we're talking about here, uh, joint fluid tends to not be a prominent fa factor. In fact, if you have a lot of joint fluid, it usually kind of excludes the diagnosis. So uh, th that's that's helpful in trying to differentiate where there might be infection versus uh, inflammatory, non-infectious inflammatory like this. It also depends on the stage, doesn't it, John? Yes, it is. This would be an early stage where it's just the inflammatory stage. Okay, and then uh, one thing that was uh, pointed out in the radiology literature uh, back in the late 1990s is to look for the rotator cuff interval on uh, sagittal MR examinations. So, uh, um, Excuse me, John, if I got... 
if you don't mind, I'll just add a little stuff from the recent orthopedic yeah. literature. Uh, yeah. um, they don't mention an interval. Okay. Um, all, all they do is mention the thickening of the capsule. Yeah, well, in, in the radiology literature, the interval is a uh, key component of the, the diagnosis. But, okay. So here we can see the coracoid process in the sagittal plane. This is be the long head of the biceps tendon. Here's the humeral head, supraspinatus subscapularis. Here's the capsule in the subsca uh, subscapularis recess and through here. And as you all know, this is the coracohumeral ligament coming across uh, here. And then it kind of adjoins the, the uh, soft tissues and attaches to the, to the humerus uh, in that location. And so this is the area we're looking at. Normally, you should have a nice triangle of fat here. The capsular margin should be nice and thin and sharply de defined. The corcohumeral ligaments, uh, likewise. Uh, when you start getting a thickening of the capsule, this would be early stages where you uh, uh, start getting uh, 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 capsulitis and, and uh, scar tissue involved in, in the capsule. And the axial plane, this is the area that we're, we're interested in. And you can see early on, the, the scarring and thickening occurs right in through this area on the axial images. Uh, and then as, as it gets worse and worse, you can see more of the fat in this triangle being replaced uh, by non-fatty tissues. So here, this isn't normal. This should be nice and uniformly bright in signal intensity. So there's a little bit of inhomogeneity in through here, but the corcohumeral ligament is nice uh, and, and looks fine. Here's the long, uh, the long head of the biceps tendon. There's the capsule, uh, fairly well-defined. Here is kind of a moderate degree of uh, replacement of the normal fat or effacement of the fat uh, with uh, inflammatory or scar tissue in through here. And a prominent feature of this is that it involves the long head of the biceps tendon, and that may be a component of the pain picture when it involves the long head of the biceps tendon. And here's the more severe findings where all the fat in the rotator cuff interval is replaced. You can also see this on ultrasound. In fact, it might have been first described on ultrasound and surgical findings uh, where you get uh, thickening of the capsule. But I find that MR is uh, a lot easier to visualize this. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Uh, you know, forget it. This, this is the, 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 this. The, 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 let, me, let me just describe this. One of the uh, findings that we did back in the pre-MR days is that we would do an arthrogram, and if you saw very little filling, or if you knew you were in, and you saw very little filling of the joint space or very small joint space, that was the way the diagnosis was often made and treated because one of the treatments was then to inject uh, uh, saline under uh, hand pressure uh, to try to lyse some of the adhesions within the joint space uh, and get more motion like this. Um, uh, De Palma in, in, um, in his day, that is in the 70s and late 60s, um, dissected um, quite a few shoulders in the 70s, um, uh, number 70 or 80 shoulders, and found that um, uh, folks with uh, thickened capsules that they felt that, uh, and these were patients of his that had died, um, that, that, that they had, um, um, not only a, a, a problem with a capsule, um, but also um, uh, the, the biceps was always involved. Okay. Yep. And and and, and uh, bicepital, um, um, I guess tendonitis or tendinosis, whatever you want to say. Uh, was a, a, a problem in every case uh, that he dissected. Okay. That's a lot of patients, by the way. Yeah. So kind of historically, it was first described by Codman back in 1934. The stiffness, difficulty sleeping, which is a problem in almost all shoulder pathology. 
and then marked reduction in forward elevation and external rotation, and then uh, Nevaser, uh, term the term uh, adhesive capsulitis in 45, uh, Dupuy periarthritis in uh, I guess in 1872, but Codman was the first real description that was this particular uh, syndrome. Periarthritis was very nonspecific. Uh, so anyway, and people have a tendency to sleep on the side of the pain. Okay, uh, and that may be. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, in fact, I, I always have thought that maybe that's one of the reasons we get um, degenerative disease on the shoulder with it, the side that we sleep in, because that's the shoulder that bothers me most, although both of my shoulders have pain, but I've always felt that I always ask my, ask my patients which side they slept on, and usually they slept said that they slept on the side of the pain. Interesting. I didn't know that. It, it, it is interesting. And Campbell's in the new book uh, mentions it. Hmm. Okay. So it's uncommon before the age of 40, typically peaks in the sixth decade of life. Women are much more commonly involved than men. And then it's bilateral in a relatively small percentage of patients. And then uh, here they say steroid injection, physical therapy, and then you can also do arthroscopic release. Bilateral, probably in the diabetics and so on. Right, yeah. Uh, though uh, the, a lot of this therapy is still somewhat controversial. Uh, and here's in, in this paper just showed three phases and they talked about. And according to this, uh, 30 to 36 percent of patients have uh, diabetes. Other things associated with it, and, and they tend to be more resistant to treatment. Um, Other things are uh, thyroid disease, hyperadrenalism, Parkinson's, cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, and stroke. Um, also, the diabetes is insulin dependent okay. in almost all cases. Okay. Uh, the other diabetics don't don't have a problem. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, in sports, uh, the people that do the throwing, like I, uh, uh, pitchers. Okay. And and quarterbacks. Interesting. But they had got the disease not in the throwing shoulder. Yeah, the other shoulder. Uh, right. Which is interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Ashley, what do you think of this case? Um, so we we're looking at the, uh, the rotator cuff interval, and you can see a little bit of scar tissue. It's in the rotator cuff interval, maybe involving the biceps tendon there. Yeah, right. You really don't see the fat going to the biceps tendon, and that's that's not normal. So this would be a uh, 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 mild effacement of the fat within the rotator cuff interval with involvement of the biceps tendon. And here we can see a lot of edema in that particular area on the coronal fluid uh, sensitive images. If you remember that axial image we saw before, uh, this this is area where you should have fat and we're seeing some replacement over here near the biceps anchor in that area. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jennifer. Okay, well, here as well, it looks like there's some mild effacement of fat in the rotator interval. There's also some, it looks to me like this could be some fluid signal intensity in the subscapularis recess as well. Okay, so we have the fluid there and then some moderate effacement of fat within the rotator interval. So this may be seen with adhesive capsulitis. So this is, uh, uh, that's not much fluid, is it? It's a moderate amount. It's more than we usually see it with people with frozen shoulder because they usually have very little uh, fluid within the joint space. Okay. 
this on the sagittal um, image we see essentially near complete effacement of the rotator interval. Um, so that uh, effacement of the fat within the rotator cuff interval. And the next thing you need to look at the middle glenohumeral ligament on the axial images and the inferior glenohumeral ligament on the coronal images to see thickening of those. And uh, you look both for thickening and edema. Okay. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Uh, so this is a 64-year-old mother-in-law of a local orthopedic surgeon with pain on external rotation, rule out rotator cuff tear. There is a significant um, effacement within the rotator cuff interval um, of the normal fat there. Um, and you're, looking, you're concerned about adhesive capsulitis here. You're looking here, you also see that there's quite a bit of effacement of the uh, normal um, rotator cuff here. Now, now, one thing I want to point out is uh, you may go out in practice and the orthopedic surgeons will be surprised that you'll comment upon on a frozen shoulder on an MR report. And the issue there is many places, the only sagittal images that the radiologists get are fat suppressed, proteinensity fat suppressed images. When you do that, it's very hard to look at the fat in here because the fat is suppressed on the technique that you use. And therefore, a lot of radiologists don't really think about making this diagnosis on MR examination. Again, I think it's very important that uh, the sagittal images not have fat suppression, or if you do a fat suppressed sagittal image, that you also have a non-fat suppressed sagittal image because as you've already seen this year in practice, in practice here as fellows, now this is a very common diagnosis. And now I see a lot of, uh, it's not infrequent for patients to be referred for MR imaging with the clinical diagnosis of frozen shoulder, and that's what they want us to evaluate. And in the past, when I've given lectures to the orthopedic fellows at Curl and Job, uh, one of the things they've always asked me to do is talk about how to make the diagnosis of frozen shoulder, because they know they're going to see a lot of that when they get out into practice. Uh, it, it, it can be missed um, at, at, at the end of the, uh, when there's thawing of the, of the disease, um, because many times in this age group, you see degenerative uh, disease of the rotator cuff yep. and, uh, and tears, and uh, that can be confused with uh, frozen shoulder, uh, because on exam, they're, they're pretty similar except frozen shoulder the, uh, the biceps area is very very tender but it's usually tender anyway okay Michael here's an Arthur so we have an Instagram so I think what I'm seeing is kind of a paucity of uh, contrast within the rotator interval or kind of in the area, so I'm wondering, like, it's, you know, if it's just kind of a tight capsule is what we're trying to look at. Yeah, that. So MR shows kind of marked thickening increasing on the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So I mean, you'd be concerned for adhesive capsulitis. What about the axial? Axial. I mean, in the axial, we're also seeing thickening of the kind of middle glenohumeral ligament, it looks like, as well. Or is that the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament? Yeah, this is back in the middle. Okay. Right here. Now we're just still seeing uh, the effacement of the fat within the rotator interval. Here you can see all this area as you go down in the area of the middle glenohumeral It's completely uh, thickened. And... This, this, is, uh, this was uh, pretty rip roaring adhesive capsulitis. And, uh, and it's been shown that uh, both enhancement and uh, really edema on the PD fat set images of the X-ray recess really correlate very well with limited range of motion and pain. And that we typically see on the coronal images. John? If you look at uh, inferior, uh, like in this image, this is what uh, uh, Campbell's uh, on MRI commentary mentions the most, this and and thickened capsule, uh, but this area being uh, 
uh, thick and and uh, no fluid being in a in a, in a in yep. a capsule or space. So here we can see this marked thickening of that intraglenoid humeral ligament, and it. Got oh, this is. Yeah, I'm sorry, John. This is what excites Campbell's the most. Okay. And then here we can also, even on the axial images, see thickening down here with just a little bit of fluid. A lot of thickening down in this area. Uh, up here is just uh, the subscapularis recess. Are, are we going to get into treatment eventually? Yeah, eventually. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. All right. Who did the last one? Okay. Ashley, what do you think of this case? So this is an axial sequence, and um, we're kind of focused on the anterior capsule here, which looks thickened, um, and so that's concerning for capsulitis. Yeah, and this one, the posterior capsule, was very thickened as well, and this was a patient who had pretty classic frozen shoulder symptoms. All right, so here it looks like there's effacement of fat in the rotator interval, and then if we go down a little bit, there's thickening of that middle gonohumeral ligament and anterior capsule. This is also concerning for adhesive capsulitis. Um, what you can see also, I think, and this is um, just my observation, uh, that the capsule is very prominently noted attached to the ligament. Uh, the ligament actually is uh, a thickening of the capsule pretty much. Um, and some ligaments are thicker than others in a normal individual, um, especially in females. You don't see it as, uh, as prominent as in males. And many times you don't see the capsule at all. All you see is just a um, I mean, you don't see the ligaments uh, at all, just maybe a capsule here and there. Um, if I may be correct, I'm not sure I am on that one. Okay, between our female, real adhesive capsulitis. Looks like we have a effacement of the rotator interval. And on the axial images, it looks like there's increased signal where there's effacement, so this is kind of more edematous uh, phase. And then and this is an MR arthrogram. So now on the arthrogram, well, I mean, on the arthrogram, now we've expanded the capsule or the joint space. So this is the T2 sagittal. Uh huh. This is an actual um, defect. Yeah. That might be a, a, a part of the treatment. Uh, I, I don't know. So, so on the T2, we can see that. We don't see the fat very well here. On the actual T1 fat set, we can see a lot of contrast in here. But then if we look at oh, the... These, different dates. Says different T, dates. these are different dates, right. So if you look here, this is 321.13. Now this was the previous study, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, also an arthrogram study. So we'll, we'll, what do you think? What I want to point out here, is that in actuality, these studies are the same uh, study, except the one on uh, three twenty one thirteen. They use two concentrated a contrast, and therefore on the sagittal T twos, the uh, contrast was low in signal intensity. Uh, this was actually not scar. This was all contrast. So I just again want to point out that if you're dealing with T two weighted images, and you have the contrast is too concentrated, you can get fooled. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, so this patient has left shoulder pain for several months, um, and then shoulder swelling. You can see quite a bit of swelling um, along the lateral aspect of the shoulder. I think mild swelling there. I don't really see much, though, other than that. Oh, you don't see much swelling? Oh, okay. I, I don't see much other than swelling. Okay, but now... Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. oh that, that's a lot of swelling around that. Uh, I, I think we're getting out of it. Let, let's stop here for a second. John, uh, at this point, why don't you talk about treatment? Uh, okay. Um, 
uh, in phase one, uh, what you like to do is see these people as soon as possible after pain starts. And um, I, I, what I used to do is see the patients frequently and um, be very nice to them and be very um, positive about their future and so on. Um, and pain medication, i.e. Um, Advil, um, um, Aleve, etc., whichever you, you prefer. And there, there are many others um, by prescription and so on. Um, are very helpful and um, occasional cortisone injection. Uh, hyaluronate is being um, advocated by Campbell's as being better than steroids um, because it doesn't it cause as much uh, uh, reaction uh, in terms of inflammatory uh, results from that. Uh, Cortisol may cause. I, I disagree with them on that. Um, I, I, I um, prefer uh, Aristospan, which is a very concentrated and, and very slowly absorbable um, cortisone preparation uh, and may last up to a week or more. It's initially all cortisones are a little painful um, and irritating. Um, but um, that that can be taken care of with uh, uh, Advil or any anti-inflammatory. Um, you can give cortisone orally. Um, now, now, if all these things do not help, and you're getting into phase two. Um, and stiffness, um, you may have to get into manipulation of the shoulder. Um, that is still an acceptable procedure and uh, indicated. And uh, the results are reported to be quite good. Uh, what you do is you put the patient to sleep, you, you take the arm uh, right below the axilla, and um, you manipulate that way. If you try to manipulate below the elbow, you're going to fracture the, the humerus. Uh, that's a no-no. Uh, obviously, you know what's going to happen there. Um, you're going to wind up in court more and more likely, and our insurance will pay before that. Um, open procedures are not any better than probably um, leaving the patient without any treatment, which is another way of tr treating these people. Uh, you may not decide to treat the patients, and some are better that, that if they weren't treated, depending on who is treating them. Uh, so that's something that some orthopedic surgeons do and or their family doctors. Um, Excision uh, surgically, incision of the capsule and so on, um, may be a last resort, but it's not very effective. And um, that's basically it. But TLC, in my experience, occasional cortisone injection with very, very gentle technique. Uh, anesthetized with a tiny 27 gauge needle or 25 gauge needle, but now they even have a 28 gauge needle with the uh, anesthetic and then put in a, a, ste a steroid after that into the um, joint and or subacromial gibbous or whatever or different areas. I inject it from the posterior aspect. I find that to be less painful. Um, that all the injections I ever done were from posterior aspect. Um, once I learned that it was less painful. Um, so that's basically the treatment uh, of these cases. Almost all uh, recover, um, maybe 10% uh, 
uh, will not do well and those who end up with surgery, et cetera, and problems, um, chronic pain, stiffness. And stiffness is found in everybody regardless of treatment at the end. Uh, although the, many people that recover, 90% do, they think they don't have any stiffness or, or limitation. But the reason they don't find that is the fact that they adjusted to it. Um, if you examine them carefully, you will find about 5% stiffness in a shoulder that's affected. Um, and that's what I found. And I always measured these folks, as I, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, all my patients were examined with neck problems, et cetera, and uh, shoulder problems or upper extremity problems. And uh, I found atrophy to be uh, present in quite a few people that had this problem. So, Thank you. Ashley, why don't we do this study now? Well, again, this there's moderate swelling along the lateral shoulder, but I don't see anything else. And then here we see on the T1 and T2 sequences, there's uh, quite a bit of... Um, uh, rounded uh, uh, loose bodies or, or synovium within the uh, within the moderately distended and uh, fluid-filled joint space, um, most consistent with synovial chondromatosis. And this is what it looked like at surgery. And they found dark dark red mucous joint fluid, and these are all chronic inflammatory. Panis, and they saw no cartilage in this particular patient. So, okay, uh, Jennifer. Oh, inflammatory. Okay, so here we have large regions, extensive full thickness chondral loss along the articular surfaces of the glenohumeral joint with cyst formation and a moderate joint effusion. And there is some superior migration of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid and narrowing of the subacromial space. Um, I'm suspecting there may be a full thickness rotator cuff tear, but I can't see it on this image. Um, so this looks like severe degenerative disease. And, uh... Here's just some others, these big subchondrocystic changes, you've all, you've all seen that. Uh, a lot of cartilage, full thickness cartilage loss, a little bit of uh, uh, um, regularity. Of we don't see any osteophytes. Does that, does that bother you any, John? Well, here are osteophytes. No, no, oh, I see. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, right here. I missed right those here. earlier. Yeah, right in through here. Right, got it. Okay. Uh, now, as you all heard from a recent conference that we had, uh, for these patients, if they're thinking of going and doing a total shoulder, there are classifications and looking at the, the, the bony deformity, which occurs with chronic uh, 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 osteoarthritis. Uh, the principal in these is called the Walsh classification. Uh, I, I think I, I would just describe it. Uh, the, the, the key ones here, when you see this focal remodeling, it t tends to be posteriorly here. This is a B2 type. I, uh, like all the other classification systems, unless you're dealing with someone who specifically is interested in the name of the classification, I just describe it. And then here's really more of a congenital uh, abnormality that we talked about before, uh, where two typically this is usually associated with a very large posterior labrum, which uh, classically is torn. So. That there are different types like this, which may affect the way in which the surgery is done. The main thing is just to describe the, the remodeling and the configuration of the glenoid. Okay. Uh, what do you think of this case? Well, first, there is severe degenerative changes to the humeral joint, complete cartilage loss, subchondral cysts, sclerosis, edema. There's also this low. Uh, low signal intensity structure anterior to the subscapularis, which is probably a loose body within the subscapular recess or the subcorpoid. Uh, yeah, a Roman coin sign. 
and it's uh, very characteristic of appearance where it actually looks like it's kind of circular with these little projections around the edge. Obviously, it's just more of a spherical type mass, but it, uh, they characteristically have this kind of odd appearance called the Ro uh, Roman coin sign. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Well, it looks like there's advanced, a well, patient has chronic shoulder pain, but advanced erosions of the superior medial humeral head. And you can see that there's uh, extensive uh, changes in uh, remodeling of the glenoid as well. Um, this looks like uh, pretty bad uh, osteoarthritis. It almost looks like this might be a neuropathic joint um, given the degree of degeneration. And yeah, it makes sense. You get a cervical spine and you can see, uh, yeah. you can see quite a bit of uh, uh, increased signal within the central cord. Good. Yeah, and, uh, they can be bilaterally, but it's usually asymmetric when it's this the case. But it, when it gets really severe, because you know that it would be very painful to have that much bone destruction, uh, think about neuropathic disease uh, and uh, I'll go for the cervical spine. And then there are a lot of different tre treatments, but typically arthroplasty is uh, really what you have to. Uh, uh, go for in, in these patients. And most of the patients who have severe uh, glenohumeral osteoarthrosis uh, tend to have intact rotator cuffs, but certainly not all of them. But the integrity of the rotator cuff tendons and the deltoid muscle have to be specifically described in your reports because they'll affect the way in which you would surgically manage these patients. Indications are. Uh, and uh, John? Yeah. Uh, if you can go back to the um, photos, uh, the one um, uh, labeled C and um, uh, the adjacent one, I think, is the same one, an axillary view. Uh, that's a reverse shoulder. So you see that the, the, the others are, are just a regular uh, prosthetic uh, replacements. Uh, but uh, the C and D, um, and that's a reverse shoulder with cement. Yep. Oh, wait a minute. Um, it doesn't have cement. No, I don't see cement. Um, not, not in the humerus, anyway. I'm not sure about that. What do you think about the uh, uh, no area? Yeah, I don't see cement in this one. Okay. Okay, so severe proximal fractures may be treated with uh, hemiarthroplasty. Osteoarthritis with the glenoid is really not involved, it's just humeral head. Arthritis with severe glenoid bone loss. These are, uh, I, I haven't seen, actually I read a case earlier today that was a hemiarthroplasty that they then went back in and did a total reverse shoulder. Uh, most of the cases that I see uh, uh, around here, the surgeons tend to do uh, uh, total arthroplasties rather than hemis. Uh, you know, I've seen reverse shoulders on a golf course play golf. Yeah. And yeah. you can't tell the difference. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing how well they can do. Yeah. I, I know one guy I've known for 20 years and has had this, uh, well, maybe not quite 20, but uh, over 10 years. Uh, and uh, he hits the ball very well. In fact, both his shoulders are reversed. Yeah. So looking and at And you, you seen his verse, by the way. Okay. All right. So uh, you know, when you go back and, and look at rates, one of the reasons why I think we don't see a lot of hemiarthroplasties is that the outcomes are, aren't really as good as the as a total uh, arthroplasties. And the indications for reversed uh, hemis are if you have massive irreparable cuff tears in low demand patients uh, with intact deltoid. That's the classic uh, uh, reason to do a uh, reverse hemiarthroplasty. Contraindications of doing the reverse is you, you have to have a functional deltoid if you do a reverse. That's what allows you to, to move the shoulder. Obviously, infections, neuropathic joints. Uh, and uh, a glenoid that you can't reconstruct would make it not possible. And that, that's about the same as um, 
uh, doing any kind of replacement. Yeah. And uh, pre-surgical planning, the, there are different classifications, but uh, basically typically do x-rays, CTs, get CT to better look at the bones and so forth, but now a, a lot of the surgery uses uh, computer-assisted uh, uh, technology, and you need the CT scan to put it into the computer. Uh, so that you you have it in the in the operating room when you do the procedure, and then uh, most of these patients will get an MR to look for the soft tissue, cartilage, and other and bone changes within the within the shoulder. So there are there are complications. Uh, one is called overstuffing, and that's when the uh, implant is not the proper size when it's put in. Uh, you can obviously, uh, a lot of these patients will, since they have degenerative disease, the rotator cuffs often are intact, but you can always get a, a tear of the rotator cuff after the surgery. Periprosthetic failures can occur in the cement, they can occur in the bone and in the prosthesis themselves. You can get implant loosening and instability. And then uh, it's, it's I, with the reverse, the the, let me go back here if I can show this, and this is a case I had today. Uh, uh, often what will happen is you may not have enough clearance for the inferior part of the humeral prosthesis uh, to clear the bone down here. So you can get notching and sometimes pain uh, by not having, uh, by, by having a bone in here that impinges upon the, the, the graft. So that's another thing to be concerned about. Okay, all right, let's see. Who did the last one? I don't remember. Uh, here, Michael, why don't you do I that? think it was me, but. Okay, all right. Jennifer? Mm -hmm. um, here it looks like there's transverse decreased signal intensity along the superior glenoid. Um, looks like this could be a fracture, non displaced fracture. I think the bones are okay. Okay, we also have um, fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. And I guess, well, more so edema. This could be de denervation. Yeah. Okay. Um, it could be due to a tear of the labrum with paralabral cysts and denervation. No, I don't see any parallel. Uh, Parsonage Turner syndrome. Again, it's considered idiopathic. Edema, it tends to uh, resolve after three to six months. Uh, it's, uh, some people believe it's kind of a transient neuro neuropathy uh, with uh, neuropathic denervation of the muscles, which then can, can heal. Uh, in some cases, it may actually be muscle strains, which can present this way and can heal. Okay, Michael. Okay, increasing shoulder pain for two weeks after URI. So it looks like we see increased signal in the, um, in the assume that is the infraspinatus and then the supraspinatus and maybe in the deltoid as well. Um, so similar thing, there's just kind of not specific muscle data. Yeah. So some people believe it can be post-inflammatory, though. There really isn't really good data. Uh, a lot of people get colds and so forth, and whether that's an actual causative agent or not, I think is still disputed. Uh, Ash, Ashu? All right, so 42-year-old male with pain and weakness. Um, we can see um, increased signal within the supraspinatus and um, and also the infraspinatus, also consistent with uh, Parsonage-Turner syndrome or brachial neuritis. And uh, clinical compression, they, they thought it was a nerve entrapment, but we don't see any entrapment of the nerves here. And this was another uh, Parsonage-Turner syndrome. And some people also call it acute idiopathic brachial neuritis. There are a bunch of other names for it. And again, nobody really knows the, the, the etiology. And it's probably multifactorial. There are probably a number of things which can cause it. If, if I've seen one, I, I must have misdiagnosed it. 
Yeah. I, know, I haven't seen a case. Okay. So that means I probably missed a few. Yeah. Well, I think clinically it's a very hard diagnosis to make. Um, maybe the, the family doctors see these. I don't know. Like I said, uh, I'll, I'll admit it. I've never seen a case. Okay. So here on the right side, we can see an asymmetric appearance of the superior aspect of the trapezius um, compared with the contralateral side. I believe this can also be seen with Parsonage Turner. Yeah. These are oblique images, so there's going to be asymmetry. Uh huh. But this is thickening. So what do you think might be going on here? So, no trauma, thickening. Uh, uh, that's, that's the brachial plexus, isn't it, John? Yes. I see. Okay. So then in, if we have thickening of the nerve roots of the brachial plexus, this could be like Charcot-Marie tooth, or sometimes, I, I believe, Parsonage-Turner, you can have thickened enhancing nerve roots in the brachial plexus. Yeah, atrophy so, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here they're edematous and neurons. This was thought to be a brachial neuritis, also of uh, unknown etiology in this particular case. I think some of these can be trauma with stretching of the nerves, which produces you know, irritation and a, and a neuritis. Uh, if they were symmetric and you didn't have a lot of edema, then uh, then uh, 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 then some of the other diagnoses uh, the more the more uh, uh, could be made. But but this was really unilateral, and we can see a lot of acute edema here. Uh, sarcoma is in the more in the uh, in lower extremities, isn't it? Well, it can be in both, John, but it's... Yeah, I know, I know, but they, they usually start in the feet. Yeah, they, they start in the in the feet and the legs because those are the longest nerves, and yeah. all the nerves are involved, and uh, the longer the nerves are, uh, the the more the, the nerve is affected by the underlying disease process, so you almost always pick up the clinical symptoms in Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome in the lower extremities first. My ex-pediatric um, orthopedic chief uh, um, back in Cincinnati, uh, his um, stepkids had had the disease, and um, um, I remember that they had cavus feet, quite pronounced. And my chief was so so-called expert on flat feet. I think because he had fat feet and was uh, not uh, uh, drafted or, or was rejected from the army in the Second World War, and he 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 became a fanatic on flat feet um, casting. Well, we'll get to that later. So I'm, I'm yeah. taking up too much time on this okay. interesting situation, though. Okay, so there's a looks like we have increased signal involving uh, some of the muscles along the posterior uh, thorax. I don't know if that's like the inferior part of like the lower. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to figure out exactly what that'd be coming around. So that looks maybe like the inferior part of the subscapularis almost, or it'd be like the teres major. Wing scapula. Wing scapula is due to uh, a serratus anterior and long, long thoracic nerve. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, yeah, this is the ser ser serratus anterior muscle, and it uh, and it was uh, a, a neuritis evolving it, so it didn't function properly, and therefore they lost got control of the uh, of the scapula. Okay, uh, Ashu. 
All right, so um, this patient had a BCG vaccination seven months ago, and we can see within the left axilla there is a mass which looks uh, heterogeneously enhancing um, with increased T2 signal. And on the ultrasound, um, there's some necrosis and there's some, um, some calcifications and shadowing, um, no real vascularity. Um, we're continuing, uh, patients has fever, there's some moderate uh, edema, there might even be some, some enlarged lymph nodes, it looks like, in, in that area. So we're, lo we're, we're looking for, we're concerned about an, an infection here. Um, this looks like a injection. Yeah. You know. And this is a reaction, inflammatory reaction from the uh, inoculation. It was mostly in bladder cancer. Nowadays, right. Uh, right, chest while swelling. Margie had uh, an injection when she was a nurse going into Herman Kiefer Hospital for uh, uh, treating tuberculosis. That was a tuberculosis hospital in Detroit. Yeah. So that was uh, all the nurses used to get the. Uh, a series of injections which made their test positive, um, the PPD. Right. Uh, which, uh, that, that's, uh, that was the unfortunate part. Okay, so we have a two-year-old with right chest wall swelling for three days. Um, it looks like there's a partially calcified shadowing mass deep to the pectoralis. Um, now, six days later, we have some radiographs and we have some lytic appearance along those right ribs. Um, so here we have a T2 increased signal intensity lesion along the right ribs and it's hot on the bone scan. Um, this can be Ewing sarcoma or Eosinophilic granuloma. This oh, okay. Another reaction. So this is also oh. so, so reason why people are concerned about developing vaccines is that in, throughout the history of vaccine development, there have been a lot of uh, adverse reactions to vaccines. Uh, and there have even been some diseases where the uh, the, the vaccine has actually made the disease more lethal rather than less lethal. So uh, you have to take the potential adverse consequences of vaccines very seriously historically. And that's why the drug companies right now are not interested in speeding up the delivery of a coronavirus vaccine until they sure that it's safe. Because the last thing they want to do at this point is create a for more people not to want vaccines. BCG is sometimes hard to get. Yeah, in, in this day and age, because it was not all that effective against TB, so it's... No, not the TB, I don't think it was effective at all. Um, I, I, I remember those days. Um, but um, nowadays, because of the treatment used in bladder, bladder cancer, it's, 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 it's uh, hard to get, because I think only one company makes it. Uh, interesting. Or maybe two, I, 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 but it, it is difficult sometimes, uh, which is tough on the cancer patients. Right. And here's a case where you can see some isolated teres minor atrophy. We've already talked about that, so we don't need to talk much more about that. And then, uh, let me just see, okay. Now, I, I was going to try, let me try to, so here we can see just the brachial plexus and how it comes out and through here. Uh, uh, here's just a case where we have a labral tear. We've already seen these with a, with a big uh, 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 cyst here going into the spinal glenoid notch, and we can see marked atrophy of the infraspinatus muscle, uh, which we've seen before, uh, right in through there. And there's, we can see the atrophy from a pure labral cyst. And then there, there are a lot of nerves around. Uh, we don't need to go into all of these. You're already familiar with the major ones, suprascapular, spinal glenoid, 
and then the uh, quadrilateral space are the primary ones that we're concerned about in the shoulder. Um, one of the, the, the things I, I read today, uh, which I found interesting, uh, you can use ultrasound directed injection of cortisone uh, around the nerve uh, in a quadrilater quadrilateral space uh, to relieve the inflammation. Um, I, I uh, would be a little scared of doing that, but uh, that's, um, I guess, pretty common. I think radiologists do it, don't they? Or neurologists. Some of them do, but you really have to make the diagnosis of what's causing the inflammation uh, uh, right. If it's due to an intralabral tear, then that, then that will recur typically. But uh, right, you can do that injection. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? So I don't know if it's just kind of the cup. It almost looks like there's an enlargement of the infraspinatus, kind of, and a very small teres minor, which is kind of atrophied. So that's the left. Here's what the right side looks like. So the right side, this, I wonder if the supraspinatus is uh, atrophied, and now the teres minor on the right looks normal. Um. Is this just another nervous uh, nerve issue, like non-specific, or is um oh, there's a giant axillary lipoma pushing on the quadrilateral there's space, yeah. So it was due to, in this case, a benign lipoma, and so that really gets us in. The, we've already talked about the quadrilateral space syndrome here. Uh, uh, masses like that are very uncommon. Uh, a little bit more common are big osteophytes here, and sometimes they can get large enough to uh, also affect the uh, quadrilateral space. And uh, in this case, we have a large osteophyte affecting the nerve with severe uh, fatty atrophy of the uh, teres minor muscle. So that you can have it from osteophytes in that area. Uh, and then this, and then let me see. I think. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Well, it's a boxer with asymmetric pectoralis, swelling two days after weightlifting injury, and we see both on the coronal and axial imaging, we see increased signal within the pec major on the left. Um, it just looks like increased edema. Uh, I'd like to have a non-fat set sequence just to see what looks like. Unfortunately. Um, it's a, a strain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's a weight, yeah, the boxer could, after weight living, makes the most sense. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, they would say there was a sudden onset of pain, I would imagine, if it tore. Yeah. He was not symptomatic the day of the injury. Yeah. The so syndrome, it typically gets sore starting about two days after uh, the weightlifting. And if it's relatively severe, it's called delayed onset muscle soreness syndrome, uh, which can then last for up to seven to 10 days typically. Uh, if it's not real severe, then it's just a typical reaction you get from working out a lot. And uh, it typically gets better in, uh, after about three days. So just another way of saying a delayed sore strain. Yeah, yeah it's just a, a low grade muscle strain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here we have two sagittal images of the shoulder, and there's some protrusion of looks like the anterior scapula um, with surrounding edema. I'm not sure if this is an osteochondroma or. So, so that, that's actually the scapula. Uh huh. It's just a, a repetitive trauma event here between the scapula and the thoracic wall. Uh, there are more than one bursa around the scapula thoracic uh, joint. Right. Yep. 
Okay, so why don't we, we stop here? That's kind of the lectures that we have on the shoulder. And then uh, we'll start a new series tomorrow. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, see you tomorrow. Have a good evening, everyone.